Good evening, Hempfield. My name is Doug Hinton. I'm senior pastor here at Hempfield Church of the Brethren. I welcome you tonight on our live devotional. I pray that this comes through clear and that you may be strengthened in this time. As you sign in, as you sign on, say hello. Let me know you're here. We're going to be looking at Ephesians 2 tonight, 11 through 22. And Paul talking to Gentile and Jewish believers. I find it intriguing and interesting in this time as we delve into Scripture. How so many things that Paul spoke into and Paul wrote into and Jesus prayed over and Jesus taught continue to apply today if we're willing to be transformed by the Holy Spirit through Scripture. So I welcome you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and risen Savior and look forward to seeing you on Sunday. We canceled this, uh, the outdoor service this past Sunday. It was online. Uh, because of the rain, and I can't tell you how much that, that just hurts to do that. Uh, if it rains again while we're meeting outside, we will still have the service online, but I will put an invite out that if you want prayer, if you want to touch base, if you want to say hi, I'll set up a canopy or something outside so that we can form a line, pray together, pray over you, and uh, just see one another. There is something Beautiful when two or three are gathered together seeking Christ. Hello, Gingrix. So, as we move forward, um, if we're unable to have our outdoor service, I will still find a way to touch base. Um, I'll set up a canopy. You can stay in your car. It doesn't matter to me. I, I, I miss seeing the body of Christ miss seeing my brothers and sisters. So pray for this Sunday. We're going to continue our study in the Ten Commandments, uh, looking at lying. And uh, thou shalt not lie, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, so welcome tonight. We'll get started here in about two minutes and get the ball rolling. You know, we live in an interesting time, and we'll touch on this in a bit. There are so many ways that we can be distracted and divided. So much condescension that I see and an arrogance that I see online and rightness. Man, we love being right. We've been trained to be right in our culture. Um... And I think it can be detrimental to the, the, the way we want to move forward. Because uh, oftentimes we want to be right running people over. And uh, that just isn't, that is not Christ's way. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on that. I, uh, I started reading a, a Tony Evans book, Oneness Embraced. Uh, it's on uh, racial reconciliation, uh, specifically white and black, he names, in the U.S. Um, actually, I, I got four books on that topic, and I look forward to seeing how we can move forward and being intentional about who we connect with and how we connect and seeing one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um I think so often we have the world dictating all the other labels before brother or sister in Christ. And we'll talk about that. We'll get started here. I'm going to open with a word of prayer and, uh, and we'll dig in. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for this time and place. I thank you for the people that you have called us to. I thank you for Paul's writings that we can continue to dig into and pass down to the next generation of believers. I pray, Lord, that your spirit is with us, that the words that I speak may be given to me by you, 
and that your body may be strengthened. I thank you, Father, for who you are and what you've done and what you're doing right now. And I lift this all to you in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to dig into Ephesians 2 tonight. We're going to start in verse 11. And before this section, Paul talks about how when we were dead in our sin, when we were disconnected from God and from other people, he gave his life, and that we could be made alive in him through his Holy Spirit and by his work. And in verse 10, he says, For we are his workmanship, Christ's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. He talks about how we have been prepared for good works, that we are his workmanship. That we have been redeemed in Christ. We have been made new. He goes on to say in verse 11, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So Paul, Paul was a Pharisee. Paul knew the law better than most in his time. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, faultless to the law. And yet his ministry is to Gentile believers. And he starts naming some of the differences between Jews and Gentiles in that time. First off, the mark of the covenant was circumcision. And he was telling them, you are of the uncircumcision. That they were separate from Christ because of their, their uh, ethnicity. Excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. They were outside of the covenant people. And outside of the promises found within. And they had no hope. And looking at Barclay, he said that the, the, the Greeks at that time had this view, this cyclical view that history would go 3,000 years and then the world would be consumed by fire and then it would restart again. And the same people would relive the same lives in the exact same order. And it would just continue to go every 3,000 years. There was no hope. There was just process. And they were without God. You know, they were a very intelligent society, a very stoic society. And they had many gods, as we read in Scripture. But they had many gods to cover their bases. It was very uh, fickle. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And when, so, so when someone would, would follow Judaism, they would approach a rabbi and they would ask to be brought near. And the temple was broken up into different sections and there were different courts. And the inner, innermost court was the Holy of Holies. Only priests could go in there, only the high priest. And there were barriers between each of the courts. And he's saying, so you have been brought near to God through Christ Jesus. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, the dividing walls that they would have known in the temple, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body of God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. So in Paul's time, there were all kinds of barriers between people. Not just Jews and Greeks. Greeks considered non-Greeks barbarians. So you had these different classes of people. You had the Jews, the Greeks, the 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 barbarians, those outside of the Greek culture. 
and there was there was enmity, there was hatred, there was distance between one another. Barclay said that if a Jew married a Gentile, they would have a funeral. They would have a funeral for that Jew because to marry a Gentile was to be equated to death. And so you had these barriers between different classes of people and different ethnicities of people. And yet he's saying Christ abolished all these, that Christ is their peace. And that through Christ, he's making the two into one new man. He made peace between the Jew and the Greek and the barbarian. Now he's specifically speaking to Jews and Greeks here. He was called to the Greeks. And he was saying, through Christ, when we focus on Christ, he is our peace. That when we follow Jesus, we are no longer first Greek or Jewish. We are followers of the way. And so it doesn't remove our former identities, but it puts them in proper order. First Christ then your ethnicity, then your class. And Paul's saying the goal of the cross was to reconcile the different men. In verse 17, he quotes Isaiah, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, through Christ, we both have our access and one spirit to the Father. So Jesus promised his Holy Spirit. And when we follow him, he gives us that spirit. Whether Jew or Greek or barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, he gives that same spirit. And we have access to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. So strangers and aliens would have been common terms in Paul's time. Strangers were those who were visiting a country or a place. Aliens were those who were living and maybe even paying taxes, but were not citizens of that country. And what does Paul say? You are no longer strangers and aliens. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Let's see what Paul's doing here. He's taking... Jews and Greeks, and now he's naming aliens and strangers. And he's equating them all on the same level. He's saying your unique qualities are being built into a holy temple. And we live in Lancaster County, and I went around today and I took some pictures of some stone structures, bridge foundations, barns, houses. Church, the, the East Petersburg Church, the Real Life Church of God, there on the corner of Lemon. The foundation, I forget how old the foundation is, hundreds of years old, and it's stone. And what you see interesting about stone and, and Paul comparing them to a structure being fitted together, when you lay out stone, you got to study the stone. you got to see how they fit together and how there might be a pattern in the wall. And, and you got to lay them out and you got to plan they're unique. And yet when they're stacked together, they strengthen one another and it becomes this beautiful picture. There are foundations that are hundreds of years old, built of stone. That last longer than uh, the modern structures built today of brick. And I mean, this always makes me think of the Tower of Babel. When they would when they would build altars, they could only the, the Jews could only use stone. 
They cannot use anything man-made. And isn't it funny how we always want to make things uniform? It just makes things easier. And yet God's saying, no, no. You are made uniquely. And yet you are not made in isolation. You are made to come together. And this happens through the work of Christ on the cross. Because I will give you one spirit. So he's taking all these classes and he's, he's saying, look, you are of Jesus Christ now. You are sealed with the same Holy Spirit. Each one of you, Greek, Jew, stranger, alien, you are brothers and sisters in Christ. In whom the whole building, building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. You, you are the temple of God together. The alien, the stranger, the Greek, the Jew. Through Christ, you are being built together into the temple of God. And I want you to know how important this is because the person writing this was vehemently against the church. He was walking a hundred miles north to drag followers of the way, to drag followers of Jesus Christ back to Jerusalem so that they could be persecuted, so that they could be imprisoned. The person writing this was an enemy of Christ. And now he is a brother. And he's telling fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, you are being built together. You are first followers of Jesus. Now, it may sound like I'm getting repetitive. I may be. But let's apply that to today. You know, if I were the enemy, and I knew that my power was unmatched if I were to go up against the leader of the other side, I would seek ways to divide the weaker. I would separate them by class and generation. I would make them rely on knowledge, not wisdom separating generations so that wisdom could not be passed down from one generation to the next. I would make the world about them. And not others. And have them compare themselves to those around them, missing the larger picture. And in that way, their focus would be pulled from their leader. And they would go into confusion and they would go into anger and isolation. And I wouldn't have to be nervous if they were divided. A house divided cannot stand. But... When followers of Christ pull their attention from all the distractions that the world and the enemy wants us to focus on, and they look to Jesus, the gates of hell cannot overcome. They will not overpower the body of Christ. The body of Christ can move, whether it's in a building or outside the walls. And we have gifts and unique qualities in each and every person, in each and every culture that calls on Jesus. And we can see things that we've never seen before when we focus on Christ. Paul's word there for new isn't like a new phone 
with all the other thousands of phones like it. It's like new, as in never been made before. So I look at social media and I see how is the enemy dividing us? We have an election coming up. I don't know if you're aware, um, but I see people in party lines. We're going through a pandemic. We have maskers and non-maskers. We have race. There's Black lives matter, and then we hear all lives matter. All distractions. What would it mean to tear the walls down that we carry around to keep us safe, to keep us secure? What would it mean to release all of that tension, all of that fear? To look our enemy in the eye and say, Jesus loves you, and we have a place for you in his dwelling by his Holy Spirit, if you will come and follow after him. How much more could we accomplish? How transforming could, be, could that be to our world? It would give us hope. Jesus is our peace. It would give us peace. And I do have hope for this because I have seen it. I have seen Republicans and Democrats walk beside one another because their first priority is now Jesus and not their party line. I have seen white brothers and black brothers and Mexican brothers and Latino brothers walk beside one another because their first priority is Jesus and not their ethnicity. And this is the exciting thing. We can learn from one another. We can strengthen one another. We can build on one another. It turns out different people have different strengths, and they can do it better than I can. Different cultures have different strengths because of the way God has gifted them, and they can do it better than we can. But we need to listen. We need to pay attention. We need to study, just like those stones, and humble ourselves and watch God move. Whew. This uh, this book I'm reading by Evans, it's, it's, it's got my mind thinking, what will the kingdom of heaven look like? Who, who will be there? Will it be just people who look like me? I'm going to go with a hard no on that because... First and foremost, the, Jesus and the, the early apostles were first century Palestinian uh, people. So, if the kingdom of heaven will have all these people in it, serving one another as Jesus served his disciples at the Last Supper, what am I doing? What are we doing to live out that kingdom on earth? You know, when Jesus was in the storm with his disciples, he was asleep. He wasn't worried about the outcome. When Jesus was in the garden, he was troubled, but he said, not my will, but yours be done. He had a trust in the Father's plan. And Hebrews tells us, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. He didn't lose focus. And something awesome happened in history that has been recorded and passed down to us for generations. And it's only when we let go of all our other identities and put Christ first that we can utilize those identities to build his kingdom because we are given one spirit. 
So as you go in this time, in the culture and time that we're in, you have been placed here intentionally. You have been called here intentionally. You must ask yourself, where is my first citizenship? And if it is not the kingdom of heaven, and you follow Christ, you need to go to your king and have a talk. Call another brother or sister. Say, hey, I need to flesh some stuff out with you. Can, you. can we sit and pray? Can we read? Can we talk it out? Because when we follow Jesus, we can see things that we would never imagine. You know, later on in Ephesians 4, Paul continues to drive this home. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And he goes on and starts naming those different gifts to build up the body. <laughs> we all have unique gifts. But we're meant to use those for Jesus. So I pray as you go this week. When you feel yourself getting anxious, when you feel yourself getting angry, when you feel like you want to fight your enemy, pray. Ask Christ to come in. Look to him. He is our peace. And especially if that person that you want to start getting into it with is a brother or sister in Christ, I pray that you see them first as a brother or sister in Christ, and then have your discussion. May you be blessed this week. May you recognize that you are being built into a holy temple by the Spirit that seals all those who follow Jesus. And may those around you see the same and ask, what is different? And give you an opportunity to share the hope with which you have. May you be blessed this week, and may you be a blessing. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.